and it's all yours. And I'm ready for whenever you have questions, we'll be ready. All right, it looks like my slides are, are progressing well. So um, just to give you a little bit of an introduction to me and uh, where I am located and what I do. Um, I'm currently living in my apartment in Bangkok, in Thailand. Uh, I'm an, uh, a teacher librarian. I work at an international school here. Now, uh, our school is uh, we have is K to twelve. Uh, there's 1,600 student students, and uh, I uh, manage uh, two libraries here. Um, primarily, I work in the elementary library, and I also collaborate with my uh, secondary librarian. So, but I work with the elementary and secondary students. So. Um, I'm going to move the slide forward if I can. There we go. Oh, a little bit too fast. Excuse me. Okay. So this is really what I, I want to cover today is really kind of to give you a sense for why you would use Roblox Studio um, and Roblox in an education environment. You're being asked, well, it's just a gaming platform. So what's its relevance to, to education? Uh, and give you a bit of the where, the when, the how of how you, you would actually implement this in in a school to give you a bit of a, an idea of what it actually looks like. Um, so for those of you that uh, have, have never seen Roblox before, this is the Roblox that most kids know. They know this online gaming platform. Um, you can, uh, the kids go and they love playing jazz break, there's all kinds of games that they can play online. It's really set up as a social gaming um, uh, place. So you, when you go into a game, other players and avatars join, join you at the same time and you, you, you can play these games. And these are all games developed by the communities. Roblox hasn't built the games themselves. It's the community that has built the games and put them up here. Um, some more experienced developers actually make a living out of the, the games, um, but we don't emphasise that um, in, the, in the school setting. So this gets me to probably the, the, the biggest reason why this is relevant in the school setting, because this is where the kids are. I mean, the kids are in gaming. The, the, the numbers of, of children that um, play these games is phenomenal. We know that that's huge across the world. So it makes sense though um, then to consider what are the learning opportunities in the gaming environment, in this gaming world. And it's just really important to know that it's not just the games that, um, that the kids go in there, they play on their own and then leave on their own. This is very much a, a community. Um, and so they have affiliations, they have connections, they have community um, that they build around these games. So there are a huge number then of opportunities then for us to, to connect this into learning. If you want to, I, I do a lot of reading from the Collective Learning, um, Connected Learning Alliance, um, and they talk a lot about connecting into the interests of the students, connecting with their experiences, what's the world that they live in, who are they, you know, and then looking at opportunities for us to be able to support and build a learning community around around them based on their interests. If you go into a, a second grade class or a, a, a sixth grade class and say, hey guys, today we're going to do, you know, Roblox, they will literally just pass out with excitement. Their level of engagement is just, is just so high. Um, they love it. Um, and it's, it, it's exciting. So there's a huge amount of buy-in and engagement already. It's just for us as educators and adults to be able to look for and notice those learning opportunities. Just a moment, it's going to move to the next slide. So there's a huge number of opportunities here. So, you think, I'm a librarian, you think, what's video gaming got to do with, with libraries? I mean, aren't I just all about the, the books? Well, you know, we're about libraries and, and um, school libraries in particular. It's about information literacy. It's about stories. It's 
about storytelling, about world building, it's bringing information in. So there, you think of the, the gaming environment, this is a significant part of a student's information landscape. We owe it to them to, to help them and give them the, the, the gaming literacy skills that they need to be able to understand and make sense and critically analyse this environment that they are, are a part of. Um, so rather than just being passive um, consumers, which we might traditionally see the gaming world as being, um, there are this, there, this is an environment that they can bring their learning, bring their critical analysis to uh, and build their understandings around. So, there, and as I've said, there's these huge opportunities for building this community around uh, video games. And when you start thinking about designing video games and or critically analysing the games that we play, storytelling is a core component of this. We find that as we're talking about video games, we're talking about the same kinds of things that we are talking about when we are teaching kids about writing stories or doing research or um, uh, following some kind of inquiry, finding out information, analysing that information and then presenting that information. Video, game is, video gaming is one of those places that um, they can is a, a use as a medium for communication. Now, this is just like a, a great example here. This student um, with his hands on the computer is showing this uh, group of students this world that he created. And this world is like, a, he called it like a snowy island world. And he's created all these little snowy islands that float up in the sky. And he's given the player the opportunity to, to put on this jetpack and then they can fly around between all of these different islands. So within this community of, um, of learners here, where, where am I in this whole thing? I'm just sitting back and helping to curate it. It's these students that are teaching each other about world building, about storytelling, about design. So it's just um, a fantastic uh, place for these students to be. But then of course, there's the career uh, future career options. So we know how massively, maybe just to go back a slide, we know that the, the gaming industry has grown hugely over, the, over recent years, overtaking other forms of entertainment, um, which, you know, the music industry, film and television, um, and, and music. And you think, well, we teach kids the visual arts, we teach kids um, how to, 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 to make a film or act with theatre arts and all of those kinds of things, why wouldn't we have been able to build and develop um, games in a knowledgeable and informed way? Why wouldn't that be part of our kids' lives now? And why wouldn't that be a potential career opportunity for them in the future? I'm just going to say this at the moment. I, I've had a little trouble with my. Um, I've got. A, I'm working with an Oculus Quest, and yesterday it kind of froze up a few times. So if I suddenly disappear out of here, don't worry. I'm coming back. I'll be, real, I'll be back real soon. So just in case that uh, that jams up, I'll be back soon. Okay. So many of you. So we're thinking about these career options and. We look at, many of you are aware of Unity uh, 3D, which is similar to Unreal Engine for um, game um, development. Can you just sort of give me some hearts if you know about Unity or have just some knowledge or you've heard of it before? Yes, so a lot. many of you are familiar with this platform. And of course, it's most well known for being a, uh, a, a, a game development platform, but as you can see here, this is uh, just a screenshot from their from their website. You can see all the other industries that um, that are starting to use and be uh, uh, use this technology. Um, so we've got the automotive, transportation, manufacturing industry all using this technology. Film, animation, cinematics are using a, a game engine to be able to to be expressive and and to um, create stories. And then, of course, architecture, engineering, construction, 
all of these industries are using this same core technology, which is Unity 3D, which is a game development platform, but it's been applied in such wide and varied ways. So when a, a student are learning to build a video game and build an experience in a video game, they're not just learning video game um, skill, they're learning a skill that transfers to other engines such as Unity 3D, and they're learning to be able to, um, to uh, developing the skills that will be applied in any range of these um, particular fields. And you imagine, you know, if you're seven now, or if you're even if you're 15 now, you leave school in a few years' time. How much uh, are, are these different industries? Are, are they going going to be expecting that the, the students have an understanding of um, of this environment? So I just want to highlight that a little bit more. Um, this is the Unity 3D um, interface for designing. You can see here on the left um, are the core assets that are in their game. You can see at the top of, of that window there's the, all the different tools that, they, that the designer or developer can use um, to, to work in this environment. In the middle here is a 3D environment. So this is where you actually do the, the world building and, and the craft of creating this world um, and the experience that your player is going to have. What is it going to look like? And this is kind of, um, I was doing a, a, a Udemy course on, on Unity a while ago and this was part of um, developing that. <clears throat> and then you can see inside this world, you've got that the model of this little kind of spacecraft and you can see the X, Y, Z um, coordinates which give the, the transform or that three-dimensional position of that, that object in space. All of that information is then uh, available here on the right. You know, that particular part in this, um, that particular spaceship is, has all of this information attached to it. It's transform where it is located, the mesh rendering, uh, as well as any scripts that are attached that, to that particular um, spacecraft that define how that particular craft moves and operates inside your game. So that's the Unity 3D space. Um, that is a, a professional game development tool. If we jump then over to, if we can, just jump over to have a look at the uh, Roblox Studio interface. Oops, we just jumped three, I'll go back again. So this is um, Roblox Studio. So, as I was saying, the kids know about Roblox, the, the, the gaming platform, but this is Roblox Studio. This is where all of these games are made. And you can see, just without knowing that very much detail here, that uh, it's very similar to uh, Unity. You can see here on the left, these are a little bit like the Unity Asset Store. These are all um, assets or models that you can sort of bring into your world. I've brought these rocks and these trees and um, this sort of little magical flower over here that's hard to see. But at the top, you can see at this interface, there's all the tools um, that are available for creating in this space. So you can change the terrain, add shapes, um, and build literally anything you want. It's really amazing. And but then you can see of, um, on the right here is your asset tree. So these are all the assets in my, um, my scene in the Explorer. So I've got lots of trees you can see there. And then these are all the properties of each one of those items. So if the, when the kids are learning Roblox Studio, they're learning a skill and an understanding about how, to, how do you build basically in add? How do you build in a 3D environment and the, really the wonderful thing about Roblox Studio is, and this is the, the powerful thing, particularly for our younger, our younger students, you, you create this world. And then instantly you can click on the play button and test out your world straight away. So you click on play and it drops your character in that world and you can run around and explore that world. But then straight away the kids are in there, they're developing something and they're like, ah, you know what? I want to have a dinosaur in here, so oop, you click on stop, jump back into the design mode, you find a dinosaur and chuck it in there. Um, so this is a screenshot that I took of a world that I created 
uh, I use this for my uh, secondary students and for my elementary students, where we had been playing around in some VR experience, you know, like Deep Saber and um, some a different uh, a gravity sketch. And so we, it's been really starting to, to consider what are the design practices that you need to keep in mind for building um, a VR experience, because you don't want your user to get sick. You want it to, you want that, that user to have uh, a unique kind of experience. And you can't build in Roblox Studio in the same way for VR in the same way that you build for an ordinary game, uh, a regular game inside uh, Roblox. You have to keep in mind some fairly specific design features um, to make it uh, a compelling experience. And so, so what I was just, so we, we use in, in our school and the way that we teach, we use lots of, um, we call them mentor text. So if the kids are writing a story, we'll have um, books from the library that can be mentors for them that give them ideas about the writing style. We also, as, as teachers, educators, we, um, write our own mentor text. So if I'm asking the kids to write a story or, or do some research, I do the research and write it up myself. So they get to see how I would approach it as a as you know an amateur researcher, not uh, or an amateur story. I'm not a professional writer. So the same with the, with video game design. So I built this world for them, and I put some of these elements in into this experience so that they could go in there and, and have a bit of a sense of what it is. The character. It's super simple. Um, the character doesn't move around. You just sort of enter this world. There's the fireplace there. So you kind of like, it builds this kind of intimacy of the, the campfire. You have, have nature sounds. So the kids are like, well, how did you get that sound in there? Um, you can you can put music and sound effects into this world. I put the, the nature, um, lots of nature around. So that, you know, these bushes and trees, and then the waterfall up there in the distance um, with the sound of running water and then the moon. Uh, all design, and then uh, uh, the sit and relax sign up there has, you know, sparkles coming out to it. So I just wanted to make this not just a natural scene. I'm not trying to replicate nature itself, but what I am creating an experience and just the, the sparkles that come up and this sort of little rosy flower over here that hovers in the distance and that's got some, you know, some loose particles coming out of it. It sort of creates this kind of little magical feel for it. And that is, so then this becomes an experience that you can't have in the real world, even in nature. I've got my own signs in here. I've got information in here for them to consider, but I've got some of these magical elements just add that little bit of extra. So, I mean, that's just a very simple design. There's not really that much to that, but with some simple design features and some careful thinking about what that experience would be, you can actually create create quite a compelling experience. So, this was just an example. Um, so you can see that. So, going back, to, you know, the thinking about the career and the skills that, that the kids are learning. Um, that this connects very much into to using tools such as as Unity 3D. Um, sorry, keep them jumping forward. Too many slides. Back again. Sorry about that. I'll get there. Got it. <clears throat> so I, I I hope you can see that there there are vast opportunities and a fairly simple. Um, environment for, for students to, to really start to engage with this. So what does this look like um, for us? The where and the when and the how. Um, we, uh, most of, mostly it's located, the students do this in our library and as you can see we have um, some kind of quite old MacBook Airs. You don't need a, a, a super high-end um, device to be able to run Roblox Studio. Um, I have them set up on these tables here. Uh, you'll notice there's the big screen at, at the back. So I encourage, and this is part of that community building, I encourage students that have got um, particular skills or if there's, it could be just as simple as they want to, to show how to put a block into your world, just working with simple shapes and change the, the color of that block or the material, change its dimensions, change its orientation. It could be just as simple as that. 
but the students can just use the AirPlay just to put their screen up onto that TV screen and just share their knowledge. So again, I am not the one doing the teaching in this environment. All I'm doing is helping to connect them and into a community, helping to foster um, constructive, respectful um, interactions between those students. But really, there's so much energy around this. There's so many students that are involved in it. They really generate the learning. They will always push their skills um, further themselves. I mean, of course, there's things I want to teach them, and I do teach them particular things just to get over a hump if they, I can see they're kind of stuck on something and they need a bit of help. But more often than not, they will teach me something new, something I didn't know about it. Uh, so when do we do it? Um, because we do it at lunchtime and at uh, recess time, until break time in the morning, the, the kids can come into the library. Um, and that's just like a really open, playful situation. But I, I, a school has a, a big emphasis on learning through play and the, the power of kids working playfully. So in their mind, they will often say, oh, we're just playing Roblox. We just played Roblox at lunchtime. Whereas the teachers and the parents, myself, we can see, wow, you know, the learning here is immense. Um, and I can go into that into a little bit more detail later if you like. Um, so from their point of view, it's just very playful. From our point of view, I can see the community building, I can see the information being shared and their skills developing. Um, I also do two after school activities in this just to give the students some, um, because the lunch times can be fairly chaotic, lots of kids doing lots of different things and it's fairly short. So I have after school activities that give the students some extended time to really sort of dig into this and develop some, um, some real skills and, to, and push their skills further and develop their ideas further. Um, I have also um, at different times um, connected in with, uh, say, different math units that um, the teachers are, are, are doing in, in the classroom. And, <clears throat> and so that's offered additional opportunities um, to connect more specifically into the curriculum, into storytelling, into mathematics, into uh, research. <clears throat> but that's still ideas that are, that are just developing. So that's the, that's the where and the when. This is some of the technical details for the how. So we have the, the, the laptops out for the kids to develop in a Roblox studio. Um, they start to see themselves as game developers, no matter how basic that might be. They, they can start to develop this identity as, yeah, man, I'm, I can do this. I can, I can build it and I can learn here. Um, but then to go into VR, how do we do that? We have um, the HTC Vive, as you can see here, is HTC Vive Pro, and we have the uh, this HP Omen X laptop, which is like a super spec up laptop. Um, I don't think it needs to be quite that powerful. I was very fortunate that uh, our IT um, department were able to source like a, 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 a great device. So. <clears throat> It works very well. But once the kids have created in Roblox Studio, they develop a world and then we go, okay, so what's your next step? What do you do? Well, then they, when it's at a level that they're ready to test it out, they publish it um, to Roblox Studio and it's as simple as clicking on publish to Roblox Studio, giving it a name and the way you go, you can, it's then live on the Roblox Studio, a uh, Roblox website. And then we go, uh, in the, the browser, we open up Chrome, go to Roblox, find that game that the student created and open that up with that laptop. You need to enable um, uh, VR in, um, there's a couple of steps for that. Um, that's, it's quite, there's lots of support for that on the Roblox Studio website. But you go to the Roblox website, you find the game, click play, and it loads very quickly and then straight away with the vibe you're inside this world that you just created in roblox studio so the the, the power of this is just phenomenal the kids are like what you mean i could go back now and put a dinosaur or a, a mountain or a cave or a flaming ball of sparkles rolling around the world 
you can put anything you want in here and click publish and then jump into that world and experience what's it is it like to have this raining fireballs um, in in 3d <clears throat> I tend to be a little bit more cautious than that <laughs> because it can be you know to go from a 2d environment into that three-dimensional um, VR environment is, is very different so I do um, help the kids just to be a bit more mindful in their design they have to be careful um, because they are young children and most of this is largely untested unresearched so we have to go with any as we would with any technology we have to be very careful how we go about that um, but with those things in mind and being very careful and, and, and um, mindful of that that we can do it very safely <clears throat> so if you wanted to get started where would you start it's very simple you go to the, the Roblox website you create a Roblox account um, I have to do because I'm in an elementary school I make sure that the kids are if they are using their own account that they are honest about their birth date because that then gives them an under 13 account which has extra protections in it for younger students uh, Roblox is very mindful uh, of their uh, responsibility to young children so um, they create an account and for the younger students I also make sure that they um, they connect their parents' email address to their, their account, which it gives them an added level of security and parents, I um, involve the parents in being aware of what we're doing and their responsibility in this as well. But once you've created a, an account, you're ready to go. You go to the Create tab, click on Start Creating, Roblox will then look for the Roblox Studio app on your PC. If you don't have it there, it will just say, do you want to download? You download it, open it up, you're ready to start creating straight away. So the, the barrier to entry into Roblox Studio is very low. So I have children as young as seven that enter this and, and you know, at that age they're really just learning the keyboard or the mouse controls you know the very basics of computer science but then a lot of those kids very quickly start to develop real expertise um, and as young as seven it's quite incredible uh, in Roblox studio coding is not essential but you in, in the way that uh, unity 3d um, offers you the opportunity, I mean you use C sharp coding to, to, um, to develop your games. Roblox Studio you use the Lua uh, language. So the kids at a very early age and in, in a very simple and accessible way they start to understand when they take a script from the asset library and, and attach that to a, a block that they get to understand that what a script is actually doing in the in the digital environment. So, I mean, they're one of the most popular ones is is the kill script. So, if you bump into a block, you click play, you bump into the block, your player disintegrates and you respawn. So, the kids like to make these kind of um, uh, obstacle courses of these kill blocks. You've got to kind of weave you around this maze um, to get through. Uh, so, in a very easy way the kids start to understand what a script is and what coding actually does. Um, just pop back. Just a couple more slides. So uh, I just wanted to point out to that Roblox does offer uh, a fair amount of support in their developer portal. Um, they have this page about you know with advice about the best practices in VR. I'm certainly no technical expert or Lua uh, whiz in any way. Um, I have a lot to learn. This is part of why I'm presenting today because I'd love to connect with people that have expertise in Lua and that we can extend our, our Roblox Studio community. But there's lots of support here. Um, I use I mean, Oculus and HTC Vive also have lots of advice about you know best practices for creating in VR. So, so straight away you've got your very first lessons uh, and to be teaching the kids and thinking about design and 
um, how they're going to build a world inside Roblox and what that might look like and feel like in, in VR. And so after all of that, then you're really getting, I mean, you're getting into the really good stuff here. You're thinking about um, what is it, what does it mean to do, to, to build for VR? So this is like, I can't believe this, this is like the opportunities for us. It's like a seven-year-old starting to think about what do we need to, what are the design features of an app in, in VR? This is like incredible opportunity. Um, so we talk about the safety, you know, what, what, what do we need to do to make sure that this person that we've just put in this world, we have a responsibility for this person. We want to make sure that they're safe. We want, you know, what, what we want that to look and feel like for them. We need to be very careful. We talk about the safety of um, the person that has the headset on. Are we, you know, <clears throat> no, um, you can't be pr pranking these people. You can't be tapping them, tapping them on the shoulder. They need to know that their play area is safe. Uh, otherwise, you ruin that immersion. You ruin that, that sense of presence that you get inside VR. So the kids are really starting to learn the importance of those things in, in VR. But then now they're going, oh, so what's presence? What's immersion? And they go, wow, so if we can create this, this is actually a really powerful tool for communication. I'm really excited to see what in, in the years to come, what are kids able to then create and communicate in this environment? So, of course, comfort um, is, is important for that user. Uh, so, I, I, I hope with that you, I'm going to stop there because I really want to give you lots of opportunities to, to ask me questions and challenge my ideas because this is a big reason why I'm presenting. Of course, I want you to learn something and I want you to, to have experience something that maybe you haven't thought of before. But of course, this is, you know, as we know with VR, this is largely uncharted territory. Working with children, we have to be very careful and mindful about how we enter this space with kids. And so I welcome your thoughts and some of your ideas. So. And, and of course, if there's anything that I haven't been clear about, please um, let me know. So thank Philip, you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Philip, I have put the raise hand. So if anybody has a question and they want to raise their hand, I'll help you with the questions. Okay, so if you have a question for Philip, go ahead and down on the right hand side, you'll see the raise hand. Go ahead and put that, and then we'll call on you. Okay. You see Eric, yeah. you, I'm going to give you the megaphone and go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Philip. Thanks for the presentation. Hi, Eric. Um, no worries. My name's Eric. I represent a research group in Japan, so it's great to see another person from Asia working in this space. So thanks very much for that. Um, yeah. Tosca Killera might be one of our um, mutual acquaintances. Um, anyway. Yes, yes. Yeah, she worked at our school before, um, yeah, at some stage, like, yeah, before she came to you. Yeah, I know her well. Um, this is all awesome. Um, have you had any um like i don't know policy creation or um work with or concerns from parents as far as like privacy and data collection issues around using something like a roadblocks or a lot of these other platforms that are coming out uh with teachers or parents at all could you talk a little bit about uh i know you talked a little bit about some of the concerns um trying to keep kids safe in the environments um, but um, mm. using a third-party platform like this, and it's free, usually the business model for that is is to suck up as much data as possible then then leverage that data in some sort of commercial aspect. So I wonder if there's anything like that in Roblox and if you've thought about that and had any um, discussions with parents and teachers about it. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, I agree, um, and I'm very mindful that Roblox is a third-party um, software, and and it's a, a place that I, I don't have control of myself. So, um, so there's a couple of things to, to say that, and we I do present with parents and talk about this with parents. I talk about it with teachers um, and with the students themselves, um, because. This is a significant learning opportunity for them. So, I mean, number one, um, for most of the students, they already have the Roblox accounts. So, this is actually an opportunity to bring this world and 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 to start to understand these commercial and potentially exploitative aspects of the gaming world um, into the education setting, and then we can go right. Let's have a look at some of these games that, that you're playing. Let's have a look at some of the, the spam that comes to you or the, um, what are the, the dangers here and let's talk about these as a community. So I, I, I think for that, this is kind of like where, for many of the students, this is where they're at already. So to a very large extent, they've already made that jump and now we're providing them with the, the skills and knowledge and understanding to be a little bit more, a little bit more aware of, uh, of themselves. Um, yeah, the would... other side of that too. So one of the sorry, just something to say. Yeah. Go ahead. The, what we do inside, you saw, we, we have it set up at lunchtime and at break times. For most of the kids there, I have I set up a library account that um, that is the one that if the students don't have their own account, particularly the younger ones, if they many of them have an account but they don't know what it is that, you know they, they just log in at home play on their iPad. So they're not you know they, they can't even remember. So um, I have a library account which I kind of call my burner account. So if I feel that it's compromised in any way, um, then I can just shut that down. Um, and then, so those kids, when they go into that environment, there's none of their personal information, there's none of their data that goes into that. Um, and so that just provides just the extra little sort of barrier. At the, and it gives an opportunity for students, they, if they don't have an account or they've never seen it before, they can just have a taste. They don't have to create an account to get started, they don't have to go down that path at all. They can just have a taste. And some of the kids just go, yeah, not really for me, it's kind of cool, but not really my thing. And so nothing has been kind of lost. Um, uh, I, I also talk to parents about um, the importance of them being aware of these environments. And so for a lot of these parents with their kids that are in Roblox already, they're not even aware of all the, child, the parent protections and the security settings that they can mm -hmm manage, they can manage the chat, they can see the chat history, they can see the play history. So if they have any concerns, then they can act on it um, very with, with a lot of control. So I talk to the parents, uh, it's very similar, you know, it's like going to a public play gym or a playground. You don't just sort of open the gate and say, oh, go kids, I'll see you in an hour and shut the door and go and have a mm -hmm. coffee. Um, it's a public space, you know. There are creeps that can be in there. You need to be aware of the adults mm -hmm. that could be in that space, and you need to be aware of the interaction, mm -hmm. and you need to be aware that uh, that in that environment, in a in a playground, or if you go to a public swimming pool, man, the, the dangers are phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. And you say, well, you know, as a parent, you don't just push them in the pool and go and have a coffee. You know, you you're you're involved <laughs> and you're part of that, and and then you're really learning about threat. And then if you as a parent have a significant concern, then you just you can withdraw. I haven't had one parent do that. Um, mm. Whenever I've presented this to parents and teachers, they go, "Wow, number one, I can see this is, I can see the learning potential here, and number two, I can see how I need to be as a parent, be aware of this, and I need to be actively involved." So it really has opened up huge opportunities for that discussion around safety, digital citizenship and all of that. Um, I really appreciate uh, another, the thoughtfulness you put into that and around all the stuff, connecting it to digital literacy and stuff like that. Yeah. I, can, I mean, because at our own university, 
we we have a set of policies around social media and I've been asked recently if we need to update them or revise them for our programs in virtual reality. That's more, pro probably the lot of, larger the motivation I had for asking that. So have you had any like bad experiences that we could all learn from or like maybe trying to scope some sort of overall set of rules or policies around these? Yeah, I think um, the key is the is to build kind of community, I think, around this. So rather than talking about, you know, the literacy as a as a, a set of rules and things that they have to follow, like you have to be kind or you have to do these things. I mean, you have those in there, they're guidelines for sure. But the significance in building a community is that when we know in these public platforms that there are real, very real risks. I mean, the um, kids can be groomed in these situations. You have to be very careful. So the importance then is to build a community, a village around these kids. So you say, what does that look like? Well, parents need to talk with each other. They need to know, oh, my son's on Roblox playing and playing with your son um, or your daughter. Uh, did you know that? Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, did you know there's parental control that you can, you can be mindful of that? Oh, okay. They can jump in and the parents can build that community. We as teachers and educators can build that community. But really importantly, the students build that community uh, amongst themselves. So you know how toxic the gaming industry can be in the gaming community can be. Um, we have, you know, kids are going into that. They need to be aware of those risks. And we have an opportunity to really reframe that community. We can build a much more inclusive and, and respectful community. So to do that, so you can see the way I set up the computers in, in the library, none of it is in a kind of dark corner, you know. They're all around a table, everything is visible. So if the students see another student um, doing something that they don't think is appropriate, or maybe they, uh, they, they feel that their safety is, is threatened, it's very visible. I can, they, they can see it, their peers can see it. I'm part of that environment and then we can act on it together before it gets worse. So we have had our students um, uh, copy uh, or see someone else's password. And so uh, actually on the very last day of school before the holiday, we, I, I closed down Roblox Studio at lunchtime because, because of the, the library account that I set up the students know the username and password to get into that. Um, someone got in and, and changed that password. And so I closed it down for that day and I put up a sign and we had lots of conversation around the, the level of, of trust that we need to build in our community for this to operate. And if someone violates that trust, whether it's your own account or the shared space and we violate that trust, then um, our community starts to break down. So I stopped it on that day and we had lots of conversation and I will pick that up again um, next week when we get back again. So to, to answer your question, it's really important to build that community around that and that has ramifications for just those kids in that environment but also I hope then that that's a transferable school that if that they take into their online environment afterwards. Sorry, that's a very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great discussion though. Philip, I wanted to ask, yeah. does anybody else have any other questions? Don't hesitate to click the hand raise. No. Please, please um, connect with me on Twitter. You can see that's my Twitter handle is uh, Flipoz. Uh, I'm on Discord as well. A lot of the information or the thinking I've done around Roblox I've put on my blog, um, the library element. So you can sort of connect with me there. Please reach out. Um, I'm in all space a fair bit as well. So uh, please friend me here and just make yourself known to me and um, I'd love to continue this conversation um, after this presentation. Great presentation. Let's, let's give Philip some emojis. That was awesome.
Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And um, and thank you to the the, the organisers for for this uh, educators in VR. This is just the most fantastic, exciting place to be. You know that all my colleagues are like, "What are you doing? Where are you presenting? Are you going?" No, this is. Oh, I'm not flying anywhere. I'm just uh, sitting here in my office and I'm just presenting. It's fantastic here in Bangkok. Uh -huh. You want to take a couple more questions? Now we have questions. Okay, sure. Okay, Pablo, you want to go ahead? I've given you the megaphone. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, awesome presentation. Um, Thank you. I have two questions, but I'll just do one at a time in case someone else has one. Um, in, in your school, you've been using the Vive Pro. Um, has your team been working on optimization for devices like Quest, considering the proliferation of the Quest, um, that it's a little bit more affordable for families? That way kids can be developing at home as opposed to environments where, you know, like a company has donated a high-end computer. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. I, it's uh, We've only had the Vive for, uh, just for this year, so about, um, what, about six or seven months. Um, and to be honest, the to going into your game inside the Vive is a fairly clunky kind of thing. So even at the higher end <laughs> device, it's still kind of awkward and it's not easy. We've had to really be careful about, you know, how we allow students into that. Because if they say put a plane into their game and start flying around, it's just like that's game over. And then the kids, um, mm. uh, you know, get sick very quickly. So it is, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a bit rough and raw, and so it does require fair amount uh, around that. So what that means then is, there's not at the moment there's not support for Oculus Quest, and I've been in contact with um, Genevieve Johnson, who's the head of the education at Roblox, um, and asked her about that. She's very interested and supportive, but they don't have the technical support to extend it beyond mm -hmm. that. So I'm I am just kind of hoping that. As an organisation, they can see the the value in being able to extend even further into this into this environment. Mm -hmm. uh, my second question, if yeah, it's okay, um, I know some uh, medical research has cautioned, like universities have done some studies, cautioning from encouraging children from using VR headsets for extended periods of time, um, just related to the development of their eyes and such. Um, do you put any limits or recommendations or, or health warnings when they go to use that, that they're, and make their parents aware of those potential health risks? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Particularly for the younger ones, seven, eight, nine year olds, developmentally, you can see their behavior in that space. So, you know, I, have, I had that, um, that fireplace space and the, and the kids go in there and they just can't stop themselves from reaching out, trying to grab the things in that world. Their, you know, you can see their um, motor system and their, you know, visual perceptual system trying to make sense of it. So mm -hmm. that what that says to me is that I need to be very careful about it. So they would rarely spend more than uh, three or four minutes in, particularly mm -hmm. in Roblox, due in the Roblox environment, because it is not the most. It's not optimized. Um, okay. So you, you go in there, you test it, you can experience it, but then we swap over quickly. For older students, many of them have VR headsets at home. <clears throat> they are more able to, to control the, their, their experience. So they are a bit more mm -hmm. aware. So, if, you know, if I say to them, are you feeling sick? They'll say, uh, yeah, the headphone, the headset's off. You know, they're much more able to regulate that. The younger ones are much <clears throat> less likely to do that. <laughs> So I don't wait okay. for them to report being feeling sick or anything like <laughs> that. Um, I, I cycle them through pretty quickly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? A 
I mean, a lot of their headsets are kind of connected to that. A lot of their headsets have, say, not designed for under 13 um, for their children. And it's, I haven't seen <clears throat> any evidence or research of actual harm. This is largely unresearched. Um, there are certainly calls for concern. But I think from the, the companies, from the Oculus and from Vive, it's kind of like you can see that the headset's not designed for kids. It's too big. Um, so it's kind of a bit of a disclaimer for them to kind of say that, you know, if you put it on kids, then it's up to you to make sure you're taking care of them. Um, but I'm not aware of any sort of documented actual um, incidents that um, would um, uh, preclude younger children from using these devices. I have a question. Can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Um, and this this might be a silly question. Um, just so I'm a parent who homeschools a special needs child, and um, I'm also a military person, so I've also had a distance mm -hmm. between me and my kids often. One thing I would really love to find as a resource. Um, uh, a multifaceted resource really would be a way to actually read books with my kids uh, via VR. If we could get a way where like the text is in front of you know both of us. Um, I haven't been able to find anything like that, but I think it would be a great resource for uh, military personnel. They'd be able to read bedtime stories to their kids with their kids, um, be able to work on those reading skills. And then also um, from a homeschooling standpoint, um, I could see that opening doors. Um, uh, with tutors and such. Um, is there any resource like that out there already? Or would this be some, or would Roblox be something where we could kind of try to build a learning tool like that? Um, that's a good question. I, I think the, technically it, it is possible, but the, uh, as, an, as a librarian, I come up against this a lot, the, the copyright potential for copyright infringement and um, that we have to be mindful of the, that if we put text to same as, you know, if I read a book aloud on YouTube, a whole book, for example, then I am infringing that the, the intellectual property of, you know, that, in, and so I, I can't do that. So it'd be similar in the VR space. <clears throat> um, but I agree that the, that the so that, I think the technology is there to do it, for sure. Um, the potential is there to do that, for sure. But the the biggest limit are the legal structures and the companies and the publishing companies and those that own these platforms to be able to enable that. So um, I I think the that Roblox offers uh, an opportunity for for um, non sort of simultaneous kind of you know learning that you can the kids can be working on things you could enter into a into a game together uh, and be messaging each other you can do a, a, a activate a, a feature called team create so with two different accounts you can go into the same world and design them together on that same world which is just brilliant. Um, and I probably have, you know, maybe Skype or some kind of chat features that you can actually talk live if you're if you're separated by distance. And um, you can chat within that environment, but it is a little bit clunky um, to, to be able to do that. But I, I I would love. I mean, I'm a librarian. Story and and books and literature is my life. So I would love to be able <laughs> to to meld those in a much more <laughs> integrated way. Mm. Okay. Um, it's not, not a super satisfying answer because it's, um, as far as I'm aware, it's not, not available right now. Any other questions? If you have any questions, not I'll be.
if you just click on the um, on the it pulls down to your right and you can put, raise your hand and then we can um, give you the microphone to be able to ask a question. Hmm. Tell you what. Oh. Is he able to talk? No, I can't, I can't hear. Um, can we take everybody off of mute? Yeah, that would be fine. Well, I think, oh, I don't know. Okay. Um, Eric, do you have any questions? <laughs> Um, Philip, can you stick around for a few minutes in case anybody has any other questions or? You sure. Need to go? Yeah, I'd be happy to. No okay. Happy to. Well, thank you all for coming. This has been wonderful. And I think we owe Philip a great big applause. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I'm so glad uh, to have uh, so many people here. It's been, um, been fantastic, much appreciated. Okay. And then if you want to ask him some more questions, maybe he can stick around for a few minutes. That'd be great. Um, should I go into into the in lounge or just stay up here? You can just stay here. I think you're the last speaker. Oh, all right. I have to megaphone myself, don't I? Sorry. Thank you. I love people who remind me to megaphone myself. Because <laughs> I always forget. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, you can just stick around. I think you're the last one in this session, so right. you're welcome to if you want to come out here or uh, be more comfortable. So thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>